This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. Starting the show today is Marissa Kepley, Kansas Farm Service Agency Farm Loan Specialist, as she discusses farm loan programs at the FSA. Marissa also shares how much money has been used for these programs. Sandy Johnson, K-State Beef Reproduction Specialist, keeps the show rolling as she talks about spring-born replacement heifer development. She says what research has influenced new approaches. Part of the Beef Cattle Institute's Cattle Chat podcast in today's show as Brad White, Bob Larson, Ted Schroeder, and Cambry Schmaltz converse about the app Calf Dex and what it provides to producers. That and more is coming up ahead. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we start our Wednesday show hearing from the Farm Service Agency. And today we're joined by Kansas Farm Service Agency Farm Loan Specialist, Marissa Kepley. Marissa, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Shelby. Marissa, talking about farm loan programs today, and can you give us a general overview? Yeah, so in Kansas, um, we have 21 offices that are spread across the state. Um, Those offices are there to help producers navigate um, our various loan programs because we do have have several of them. Those offices help through all steps um, of the process, so that includes, you know, discussion pre-application, talking about eligibility, um, evaluating the application, maybe which program might fit that producers need best. Um, and then staying with them through the application process. And then if we're able to approve um, and close that loan, also staying in communication with those borrowers post-closing to make sure that they stay in compliance with their loan Um, because there are some regulations and and things that we do have to meet. Overall, you know, we strive to offer the farmers and ranchers in Kansas programs that meet the needs of their operations' financial goals. Is this a time then maybe if a farmer or rancher is having an issue or thinks maybe the farm service agency could help them, they should go into one of these offices and talk to a farm service agency employee? Absolutely, yes. Anytime that they are even, you know, they're experiencing financial distress or or have a financial need or have general questions about what we're able to offer to them, um, absolutely. They should just stop into any of those offices. We do have trained staff available Um, at all the locations that can discuss any of our programs that are available to the producers. And mentioning a couple of those farm loan programs, the direct loan and guaranteed loan program. So like you said, under the farm loan program umbrella, we do have two types of assistance available. Um, We have the direct loan program and the guaranteed loan program. They differ just a little bit. So the direct loan program those are loans that are fully funded um, by the federal government, so it's, it's tax dollars at work for the taxpayers. They're serviced directly by the agency. Um, so if, if a producer walks into the door, you're going to be dealing with the same people um, on a daily basis from our farm loan staff. Those loans, um, they're designed to help farmers to, to start, to purchase, um, or expand their farming operation in some way. What it aims to do is to, is to help all producers that we can, um, anywhere from beginning farmers who might have really limited financial history to qualify for traditional commercial credit, to those farmers that have suffered some sort of financial setback, um, whether that be a natural or economic disaster. So within the direct loan program, um, we do offer a variety of loans kind of under that direct umbrella as well to meet those needs. So we have farm ownership loans. Um, Those are loans that can be used to purchase a farm, um, enlarge an existing farm, construct um, new farm buildings, or improve structures on the farming operation. Um, And then those loans can also be used to promote um, soil and water conservation practices um, and protection efforts for the operation. Those loans, uh, the farm ownership loans, they're available up to uh, $600,000. Um, and they have a maximum repayment term of 40 years. Um, We also have what are called farm operating loans. Um, Those can be used for the normal day-to-day operating expenses, so to purchase seed, feed, fertilizer, fuel, anything like that um, that that producers are are having to shell out money for on a daily basis. 
Um, they can also be used to make machinery equipment purchases, livestock purchases, um, or we can also make some minor um, real estate repairs or improvements like corrals. Um, those loans can also be used to refinance non-real estate related farm debts. Um, the direct operating loans, they are available up to a maximum of $400,000, and those are repaid um, over a term not to exceed seven years. Um, now, I kind of talked about the, the normal day-to-day -day operating expenses. Uh, those are what we call annual operating loans. Uh, those are generally repaid within 12 months um, or whenever the, the operations commodities that they're producing with those loan funds are sold. With either of those, we also have some smaller loan categories. Um, we have micro loans. Those are available in farm ownership or operating loan uh, formats, and those are limited to $50,000. We also have some loans on the direct side that help um, youth in the communities. So um, those, are, those are youth loans. They can be made to um, any persons that are sponsored by um, a project advisor like a 4-H club, um, FFA, a tribal organization, or, or some similar agriculture-related um, affiliated group. Um, the project has to provide an opportunity for that person to acquire some experience and education um, in an agriculture-related skill. And those loans um, are available to anyone between the ages of 10 and 20 years old, um, as long as they meet that requirement at the time that the loan is closed. And they can get a loan for up to $10,000 for their, for their project. Um, also on the direct side, we do have, um, under the farm ownership program, um, we have some loans that are specifically targeted to um, what are considered socially disadvantaged um, or beginning farmers. Um, and those are used to purchase a farm. One of the most commonly used and asked about programs we have um, for that is the down payment loan program. So just to highlight a couple of the, the requirements for that program, the applicant has to make a 5% down payment purchase on the purchase price of the farm. We can finance up to 45% of the purchase price. So a lot of times we have a, a participating lender that comes in and takes care of the remaining balance. So we're working hand in hand with our commercial lenders um, in, the, in the area of the farming operation. Um, we do have some really favorable terms um, on our side of the financing. Um, we offer a 20-year repayment term. Um, and then our rate that we offer on the down payment program is 4% below our standard farm ownership rate. So really that program is developed and designed to provide favorable rates and terms um, for those that are just getting started maybe and, and get their operation off to a good financial footing. Now I mentioned the, the other side of our, our operation. Um, we have the direct loans. We also have what are called guaranteed loans. Um, now, those loans are available to farmers who might not meet um, qualifications from a traditional commercial lender. Um, so those loans, they are made and serviced um, directly by a commercial lender, so um, a bank, a farm credit system, um, institution, or a credit union. Um, that's who would be supplying those dollars and, and servicing those loans. What FSA does for that commercial lender is, is under the Guaranteed Loan Program, we offer a, a guarantee to that lender to protect against any loss that, that they may have with that loan. Um, so if, if something should go bad or, or would go bad, we step in to kind of try to make the guaranteed lender whole when, when a loss occurs. Marissa, how much money has gone into these programs? So overall, um, the prior fiscal year, which the government's fiscal year runs from October 1st through September 30th, so a little bit different than your standard calendar year. Um, on the direct side, last year, um, we had in total direct loans obligated. So those, that are, those are loans that are approved and funded, 687 farm ownership loans for just over $176 million. Within that, that assisted um, 446 beginning farmers. Um, we also had 627 farm operating loans for just under $72 million. And with that financing um, or funding, um, about 346 um, went to help beginning farmers in that category. On that same fiscal year within the guaranteed loans, 
Um, we had about 85 farm ownership loans for around $25 million and 90 farm operating loans for around $31 million. As you've talked about these programs, are there any technology updates that farmers and ranchers could be using for them? Absolutely, yes. So USDA has done a lot of technology um, improvements and and tried to make it a little bit easier um, for farmers and ranchers to gain access to our programs and information. So we do have um, an updated website. It's farmers.gov. Um, That provides kind of a one-stop resource for producers to learn about our programs, um, and that's on an agency-wide basis. So if if it's farm programs or farm loans, the site provides um, deadline reminders for various program signups, and then also it gives the producers um, access to their farm records and ability to e-sign some specific program documents. That Farmers.gov website also has a farm loan assistance tool. What that does is that kind of walks through some general questions so um, individuals can learn about eligibility for our loan programs. Um, It's kind of a progressive quiz that just walks them step by step and tells them what they may or may not be eligible for. Um, and then also gives them the ability to get some, some instructional help with application forms. Um, and then they can also um, apply online for our farm loans. Everything is, is processed electronically, um, and the application is sent directly to those offices that we have here in Kansas. Marissa, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and give us an update from the Kansas Farm Service Agency. You're very welcome, Shelby. Thank you. That was Kansas Farm Service Agency Farm Loan Specialist Marissa Kepley. As always, you can find out more information at Farmers.gov. We're cutting to a short break now on Agriculture Today, but we'll be right back. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we continue our show discussing springborn heifer development with K-State Beef Free Production Specialist, Sandy Johnson. Sandy, thanks for joining us today. Happy to be here. Sandy, as we're thinking about developing these heifers, what are a few points that you think are really crucial to having, hopefully, a successful development? Right. Well, I think most people understand the importance of longevity. You know, it takes us... um, you know, even if they don't lose a calf, at least six years to pay that, you know, where that female is starting to pay her for her cost. And the other thing is we're in this market where do I save any more heifers right now? There's uh, some uncertainty there, lots of costs, is to have an idea of the value of depreciation. And really that's trying to look at, you know, on our taxes, we depreciate a building or vehicle. Well, that same cost is really in our replacement heifer. And right now her we to try to purchase a bred heifer compared to what we might sell her for as a cow up two years down the road. Take that difference and divide it by the number of years she's in the herd. You know, whether that difference in value is $1,000 or $2,000, we know that if we only get four years out of her, we have a much bigger number than if we get eight years, right? And so that, that cost is in our system, and it's a, a way for us to think about you know, how much do we spend on these heifers in development costs? Because if they don't stay in the herd, we know we that raises our total cost. So longevity is certainly important, and we need to consider what we can do in our management system to keep those females in the herd longer. And we know a big input and cost when it comes to caring for cattle is feed. And is there a new approach and thought behind maybe how that could be a little bit lower input cost? Well, you know, we've been um, lots of years of heifer development work. And, you know, over time, people have tried a a wide variety of things. And and one of the things that people often ask about is, um, you know, what's the pattern of development? Do we we grow them at a consistent rate from weaning to breeding? Should we grow them fast and slow them down, make sure we get there? Or do we grow them slow and and then um, put a higher gain later on. So there have been a number of studies looking at that and, and really as long as we get them to a, an acceptable weight prior to breeding, the pattern probably doesn't matter. Okay, slow, fast, fast, slow, constant for that first um, service, first year pregnancy rate. Now more recently there's been people looking at some other 
factors related to reproduction. And one of the things they have noticed with looking at different patterns of gain, slow, then fast versus constant, is that the heifers that had a slow, then fast rate of development uh, had a different number of follicles in their ovaries when they took those ovaries out. And I'm being very general here now, but a a heifer is essentially born with all the oocytes she's going to have, okay? You kind of got a finite population and they're going to just decrease over time. And generally, you know, there's plenty for the life of of the individual, but there, there's some data that says as we change this pattern of growth, we've slowed down this decline in follicle number. And then the other piece of information that comes with that is some work at Clay Center where they've been able to keep those females around longer and actually track that pattern of gain, slow versus then fast versus constant. And it appeared that those females with the slow then fast gains stayed in the herd longer. So maybe we don't know the why, okay, necessarily. Is it associated with this uh, change in pattern of depletion of the uh, oocytes? We're, we don't know that. We just have been able to repeat that change in the oocytes in several studies with this pattern of growth. So that's an area that needs more work. And our challenge with any of these management longevity studies is they're very difficult to do to keep this group of heifers around unadulterated to other things that we can still conclude something about them as they're six, seven, eight-year-old cows. So we don't have a lot of information there, but it d- does appear there's some some value there. When it comes to reaching those target weights, the goal used to be 60, 65 percent of that mature body weight. But has there been new research that maybe has changed that for some producers? Well, we have certainly have have people looking at lighter development weights, um, anywhere from 50 to 58, 57 percent. Okay, somewhat less than that. And the, the idea was, one, we wanted to try and reduce that development cost because we, you know, we've got this female a lot, around for a long time before she starts paying her any return, you know, by the time we get that first calf wean. So we wanted to reduce those costs. And we also know that we've been making other genetic changes in the cow herd in, in general. And where we used to be really concerned about females reaching puberty at the start of the breeding season, that seems to be much less of an issue. In fact, we have more people with problems of, you know, heifer calves getting pregnant during while they're still nursing, essentially. All right. So as people have looked at that, a lighter development weights does appear that you can use a lower development weight. So rather than 60 to 65, maybe you're 55, 57 percent of mature weight. And there are some then commercial producers that are applying this. And so essentially, they might keep all of their heifer calves with the exception of, you know, really wild, really unsound, you know. And so they're, they're going to expose all of these heifers to breeding, use a very short breeding season, and just keep those that get pregnant in that short period of time. And, and they're able to be profitable on those open yearling heifers. Now, if I'm a, I'm going to say smaller commercial producer... And I take that approach. I have to recognize that if I don't do a good job of estimating how much growth those heifers need, okay, the winter is harsher than I expect, or something about their development does not, um, you know, reach this 55%, say, and now I'm only at 50%, all right? Well, most of the work that's been done on the lighter development weights has not incorporated any AI, maybe one one or two studies. And so we might have a, a disappointment if we wanted to AI those commercial heifers and we had them a little bit too light, okay, and we've invested in this AI. If they'll, they'll get pregnant, but, but we might get hurt on that um, if we're trying to breed them all on the first day of the breeding season. We don't have a lot of data there. And so just in general, that approach has less room for error. Okay, because we got to get them so big. We got to recognize that. And, and so 
I'm all for a slower rate of growth, but we need to monitor our progress and and recognize that uh, probably we need to save a few more heifers to give us a little cushion there. And then if, if we are incorporating an AI program with it, then then maybe we're on the closer to 60 than 50 in, in trying to conserve that. How can producers hopefully keep their livestock on track if they are maybe going for a little lighter or are still trying to reach that 60, 65 percent? A scale is our, our really our best tool. And I know that's not always easy to, um, you know, get heifers across a scale, but it, it's um, that's the best way. You know, and even if you're only uh, weighing a trailer load of them uh, and that's the way you need to do it, you know, it pays to measure things and and that allows you to plan. And if you're not measuring weight, then at least be paying attention to body condition. Um, You know, we've seen some of these dry lot heifers, they do so well and all of a sudden they can get roly poly fat and, you know, we really didn't need to spend that money on them, whether we were aiming for 60 or 65 or not, those really fleshy heifers, when they get to grass, just kind of sit there and, you know, then we don't take advantage of any summer gain on those, those fleshy heifers. And of course, that's another advantage then of the, the lighter development weight is that, you know, when they grow slower over the winter, then you really see some compensatory gain on grass. And as you look at the alternative system, you could, in my mind, it's almost wasted forage because they're, they're hardly gaining because they're so fleshy and that's, that's just where they are, you know, so that's a, you can look at that different ways, but it, it's sure nice to see those heifers gain on grass. And the thing then we need to remember for either, regardless of your system, we know that we need to get them so big by breeding Okay, whether you're aiming for the, I want to try and get absolutely everybody pregnant I can at a higher development weight, or if I'm willing to maybe risk not getting 100% pregnancy rate on a lighter development weight, by the time they they calve their first time, they still need to be in a body condition score six and have gained that weight of pregnancy and continued to grow. And so that they need to be 80 to 85% of their mature weight at the time of that first calving. So regardless of the system, we still need to reach that target. Sandy, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Glad to be here. That was K-State Beef Reproduction Specialist Sandy Johnson. She did recently write a Beef Tips article on this, which I will link in today's show notes on actoday.net. We're cutting to a short break now, but we'll be right back. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we conclude our Wednesday show with part of the Beef Cattle Institute's Cattle Chat podcast with Brad White, Bob Larson, Ted Schroeder, and Cambry Schmaltz. Bob, you and Ted and Cambry have worked on a program called Calf Dex, and that allows collection of data on the cow calf ranch and the potential to easily share that. So Cambria, I'm going to go to you first and ask you to give us a description of what is calf dex. In the simplest way, it's really just your standard calving book, electronic. And it's much easier to sort through and scroll through your page on your phone rather than trying to flip through all the pages in a book trying to find one number. Yeah, so like the calving red book, which I have found exactly. those calving red books the last few years, at least for me, it appears they've started printing them in a lot smaller font. I can't read them anymore. So I don't know, Bob, if you've had that same trouble. Uh, yeah, I've got glasses. I don't know why they switched. I don't know either. That is so odd. But uh, yeah, that's pretty small font. So what, Bob, as Cambry described it, it, so is this an app? What does it look like as far as data collection? Well, so it's an app on your phone, and there's a couple of real advantages to that. And another important advantage of CAFDEX is one of the disadvantages of a written record like a calf book is if there's more than one person, you know, calving out cows or doing chores or whatever, it's it's hard to keep it synchronized among everybody. And with CAFDEX, multiple people on the same farm can have access basically into the same record-keeping system. And so that allows 
one centralized source. Everybody can put their information into it, even if you have multiple people noticing a cow calving and writing down data and that kind of thing. The other thing is it does allow us to work off, so offline, because one of the advantages of a a paper record keeping system is I am not relying on technology. I'm not relying on cell service or anything like that. And with CAFDEX, we're able to collect data even if we're not in cell range. Now, it needs to upload once we get back into cell range, and there's some details of learning kind of how to do that. But we've tried to make it so that you can use your phone, as Cambry said, much like your pocket red book, to collect some of that same information, but in a digital format so it's easier to share among, within the ranch and it's easier to, to keep steady over years. So, Ted, one of the things that when I hear about record systems, it, it makes me remember the ones I've tried in the past. And sometimes I have to keep way more data than I have access to, or it's very time consuming. And I spend a lot of time just keeping records. How does CAFDEX compare to some of the other commercial systems that are on the market in terms of what I have to keep? Well, CAFDEX, you can choose what you wish to record, but it's designed to quickly and easily record what we believe is essential information. In fact, it was designed based upon survey work that we did, former graduate students, uh, with cow-calf producers and with feedlots who are buying those calves to understand what the highest priority information needs were, build a system then that enables one to quickly and easily, as Bob said, collect that in the field, put it into spreadsheets quickly when you get back to the office. Then from there, those data, if you have more detailed record systems, once they're into a spreadsheet, they can communicate with farm record systems if you wish to do that. But it's essential information around calving dates, calf weaning weights, calving weights at birth, associated cow ID and calf ID tag, and then the treatment protocols that that calf has gone through during its, uh, during its growing life. So again, it, it's having that essential set of information, easy to record. It can be done on individual animal basis. It can also be done on herd and group levels. If you do a group vaccination or treatment program, it can, you can easily enter that for the whole group. Uh, and the whole idea, again, here, to have that data available, it's easily accessible, it's all in one place, and it's stored for you for future use. Once again, that was part of Kansas State University's Beef Cattle Institute's Cattle Chat podcast, where they were discussing the free CAFDEX app. I will put a link to it in today's show notes on agtoday.net. That's all we have for you today on Agriculture Today, but we'll be back with more for you tomorrow. Tomorrow.